Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Common Sense. We have a, uh, an election season among, uh, upon us, I should say. Uh, November 4th will be the election, and we have the pleasure of having Viola Ryerson, who's running for Senate, State Senate. Vi, great to have you in again. Thank you, Tom. It's wonderful to be here. Yeah, it's not too, it wasn't too long ago since we sat and chatted. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you came in again. I love coming to Brockton. It was fun. Um, when Brockton loves having you. Thank you. Um, well, for those who know you and who, for those who p uh, potentially do not, uh, why don't you tell us about uh, who Vi Ryerson is and why you're running for office, and, and in particular, state senator? My name is Viola Ryerson. I come from Hanover, where I was a selectman for nine years. I have a total of over 20 years of government experience. As a little girl, I was brought up in Weymouth and spent a lot of time in Roxbury where my mother was brought up. I also love Brockton because my father, when I was little, took me here and took me into one of the shoe factories where he made uh, the last for Capizio shoes. And he showed me the machine he worked on and he told me that because he had that third job, he could go to school and make a better life for himself. And for that reason, I'm very indebted to this city. I've always thought of it as a town, but I know it's a city. And I'd like to be able to help out and help bring Brockton back to the way it was when I was a kid and the way I remember it, with lots of businesses and lots of employment. And I know we can do this, because I know if we bring businesses back to Massachusetts through tax incentives, then we will create an atmosphere that is friendly to industry and businesses, and we can make life better for everyone in the district through more opportunities for upward mobility and employment. I am a graduate of the College of Public and Community Service at uh, Boston's University of Massachusetts. I am a retired cardiovascular pulmonary um, professional pharmaceutical rep. I worked in Boston teaching hospitals. And I started life as a nurse. I also hold a, a, teaching, a Massachusetts teaching certificate in health and family and consumer issues, sciences. And uh, I have a husband and two grown sons. Um, we live, again, as I said, in Hanover, in the district, which may seem like the other side of the stratosphere, but you have to remember that I know Brockton, I have loyalty to this city, and I realize that this city is two-thirds of the job I would be doing for you if you elect me as senator and send me to Beacon Hill. If I am elected, I would like to do something that hasn't been done, and that is have regular meetings with Brockton people who want to come to those meetings, possibly in the mornings, once a month, if not twice a month because of the size of the city, where we sit down and we talk about subjects that are coming up for votes on Beacon Hill, subjects in the legislature that are important to people who live in Brockton specifically. And in this way, I can bring your opinions and your support for various legislation to Beacon Hill before we vote, rather than having office hours after the fact where I tell you what's been done to you. I think it's very important as we move forward in Massachusetts, having been through the very tough recession we've been through, that we talk about all of those issues that affect us directly, individually, by town and by city. And I'm sure you'll agree with that. I'm very happy to be here tonight. I thank you for listening and f for giving your opinions whenever you call me or I hear from you after these presentations. And I hope you'll continue to do that again if you do decide to elect me, and I would consider that an honor. I'm trying to think of what else I can tell you about myself, but I think I'll leave it to Tom to ask some questions. Well. It sounds like you have a great idea in terms of having, I'll call it a mini town hall meetings Absolutely. every so often. And uh, obviously to 
talk about the issues of the day that are affecting Beacon Hill and those votes. Like, for instance, why don't we get into one of the issues, which is the gas tax? I mean, wouldn't that have been, you know, a novel idea to have a discussion with the voters, explain to them what the issue was, and see what their input would be in terms of, you know, an automatic increase without any debate or any future, you know, legislative action? I mean, where, where are you on that? And what would you have done if you were in office at the present time and that was coming up for a vote? You know, how would you have handled things differently with that one issue? As a matter of fact, I have addressed that issue. I addressed it in 2009 when uh, Governor Patrick came to Hanover to talk about a proposed gas tax index to the consumer, or, tied to the consumer index, I like to say tied yeah, the, to inflation. Rate of inflation, right, yeah, rate exactly. Rate of inflation. I asked him at the time if he didn't feel that this was a regressive tax because you have people, let's say, coming into Boston, a center for industry from Springfield, from Hyannis, from Brockton, from all over the state. And many of those people will be working perhaps a second or third job. And they're in clunkers because that's what they can afford, especially in hard times. If he didn't think that that bore heavily on them. Yeah, and working and, people that are on a fixed budget. Right, and the answer I got was that the, the cost to them would be mitigated by what it did for people in cities. And I, I thought to myself, how can you justify taking from the poor working people of one area to give to the poor working people of another area? We're all in this together. That's what makes us Americans, that's what our Commonwealth used to be famous for, the fact that we were leaders in industry, leaders in these kinds of decisions that were fair to people. I would not vote for this. I would not advise people to vote for this. I think it's another hand in our pockets with money that is not coming back to us. It isn't coming back the way it should to the city of Brockton, nor will it. In the last few years, from 9, 000, 2009, Massachusetts taxes have gone up $6 billion. That's $6 billion during uh, what I would call a depression, not a recession. Since 2007, the state has hired 10,000 additional workers. Government doesn't make a profit. It doesn't have bonuses. It doesn't generate money other than from taxpayers. When that money dries up, as it has with the MBTA who has had to take out a bond to pay back, to be able to continue to pay salaries, then benefits that people experience from tax money are going to stop. The so, same way and, unemployment and stopped on, in on, Washington. On that vein, you know, the standard of living of people in these times, to me, is not getting better. It's getting worse. It's you know, true. trying to make it through last winter was horrible with respect to your oil bill, your oil delivery. And this gas tax, John Cruz was in earlier, says that it also affects home heating oil. So this is going to be something that people are going to feel, um, especially here, obviously, in New England, the Northeast, mm -hmm. in Massachusetts, you know, depending on what our winters are going to be like. You know, like you said, it's going to be someone reaching in your pocket again when times are already tough, when inflation is going up, when the cost of food, the cost of paying your bills. The, you, oh, we've, since you were in, the electric companies are telling us that you know, our electric bills are going to be going up dramatically, 40%. right? 40%. So, Hello. I, I know. mean, when are these people going to get it? That you're hurting working in the middle class. The wealthy people, they're, I mean, they're not going to like paying more, but they're going to be able to afford to pay more. But the middle class and the working people, this is going to hurt. It's going to hurt them badly. Uh, one night I happened to be in a local supermarket, and I, I was in back of a young man, maybe 25 to 30, who was, I can still picture him. He was tall. He was bent over from being tired. He had on his brown work clothes and his, they were all blackened with grease and muddy shoes. And he was buying just the essentials. And there was a wedding ring on his hand, just the essentials to put on the table for his family. And I couldn't help but see a lot of young people today in him. And I said, why should this man be coming home from work at 
so exhausted that for a young person, he couldn't even stand up straight. There's something wrong here, and we need to fix it. Massachusetts has become so tax, so tax ready, and yet I don't see things happening that will make the lives of young people better. It doesn't work, and I see education bill bills for education well, that are out of sight. Yeah, tuition the, the is The young horrible. people are, you know, we're but, looking at schools for my son, and you know, we sit there at the in the uh, in the admissions programs, and you know, the numbers are astronomical. You know, you know, private schools are anywhere from the high forties all the way up to seventy thousand dollars to some of these schools, and even UMass Amherst is about twenty six thousand and change to live there. I mean, so that's, that's a huge bill. And if you don't have money, um, you know, you're going to be walking out of school with this debt, you know? We, again, there are states that are addressing this, and they're addressing that issue very successfully by offering uh, courses that industry wants, and the industries, in turn, are helping to put kids through their first two years of college. It's either North or South Carolina that's doing that with Mercedes-Benz. Well, a, 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 lot, a lot of the, and, you know, sort BMW. of, you know, Vir Virginia on down, mm -hmm. education is a lot more reasonable than up here in the Northeast. It just, it just is. I, I know more families that whose kids are going to school out of state because the bills are much more, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 less at these other places. You know, but I that's wanted, telling you something about what's happening here in the Northeast. Yes, it is. And I wanted to get back to those 10,000 new employees since 2007. It sounds great. It's the way Democrats buy votes, quite frankly, in my opinion. However... What's it doing to the standard of living for you and me? Not what's it doing, a thing. What's it doing for, to the standard of living for the people who live next to these 10,000 new employees? And what will it do to them when everything collapses? And not only do they not have their jobs, but they don't have some of the benefits that would help them out ordinarily because the well is dry. People, I think taxpayers in Massachusetts are much more savvy than Democrats on Beacon Hill realize, and I think they're fed up. They've had it. I've, I'm hearing well, it everywhere I go. Well, that's why in this I state, go. that's why it's a very close gubernatorial race. In a state like Massachusetts, it should not be a close gubernatorial race because of, you know, the high, you know, population of Democrats. You know, the the state is definitely a more liberal state. I mean, it should be no contest, but it's a very close contest, and that tells you something. It does tell you something. Additionally, um, yesterday I was at a forum, and the my opinion was asked about question four. I confused it at first with unfunded sick leave buyback, which we uh, addressed in Hanover a long time ago. However. I went home, and I reread that question. And sometimes I do this, and as your s senator, if I am elected, I would always do this if I felt that I were making a decision that was ill-advised, and I something You mean told you me, wouldn't be like Nancy Pelosi and said, we have to first vote for it no. before we know what's in it, mm -mm. And, and then see what the res end yeah. results are going to be? It, is, no, I reread really? it. Really? Oh, you have a different outlook. That's well, refreshing. I, I, well, I, I believe that my responsibility, I truly believe that my responsibility is to the voter and that if I'm going to vote on something, I darn well better know it inside and out. And if someone challenges me, I'd better go back to the drawing board and find out whether I really am in tune or I'm not. To do anything else is just arrogance. Um, so I went home and I studied it again. And I came to the same conclusion. It, it is a question that I couldn't support only because I feel it will be do, do more harm to people looking for employment. So why don't you tell the people what, okay. what the question entails so the, that they, they the know? The question asks us to vote to allow for uh, one day of sick time for every 30 hours worked um, that is unfunded by employer by your employer for the, if there are only six or less employees, or 10 or less employees. I have to look at it again, so there, it's all numbers. Then it, has, it insists that if there are more than 10 employees, I think that's correct, then you get funded 
sick time for one day for every 30 hours you work, but you can't collect that until you've worked 90 days. When I did the math on this, I realized that this was a much more liberal policy than what's out there for full-timers who get one day generally for every month worked in the private sector. That being said, a lot of companies, a lot of small businesses that only apply, uh, only employ a few people are dependent on themselves, on themselves and those people working together to make the money that comes into the company. When you take one person, let's say, who's out sick out of that equation, then the employer has to hire someone else to cover that, such as in the case of roofers or laborers or people who work in um, service industry, Dunkin' Donuts and places, well, I shouldn't use Dunkin' Donuts, that's a chain, but small businesses like that. So the employer is strapped to pay twice for that day, as opposed to big companies who offer these perks voluntarily because they can afford to. You have to also consider, and that a lot of them will go under, they just can't afford to do that. You have to also consider that some employers will try to skirt it by not hiring full-time people and not giving them the hours they need. So the person who needs a full week's pay isn't going to get it because employers are trying to get around this. But that's what's happening with the, quote, Affordable Health Care Act. Employers are not hiring more employees to make them have to go into the higher mandates of the law. So it's basically backfiring. They're only hiring part-time employees so that they don't have to um, participate. And you know, that's why we have such, quote, underemployment, that the jobs out there aren't, quote, you know, high-paying quality jobs because no. everyone is skirting the law um, a law that you know was supposed to help people, but in effect, you know the negative consequence of some of these these pieces of legislation, you know, actually hurt people. That you know the employers are holding on to money, they're holding off on hiring. You know, they're, they're, people are underemployed. The, the 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 quote you know goal of all of this, in fact more people are being harmed than helped. You know, and the other thing, like with respect to the um, affordable health care law is they have not yet told, all they tell you is how many people have signed up. <laughs> the big secret is, are these people paying? No one's telling you, has the money been flowing in? Are they making their monthly payments? Have they paid their dues? It's, it amazes me that we live in such a time where you know, the real important issues about the money and the practicality are like, nothing to see here, folks. This all sounds good and sounds all happy. And, you know, people want to say that, you know, oh, you're insensitive, you're this, you're that. <laughs> These policies, in es essence, harm people. They don't hurt people. I mean, they don't help people in, in many cases. If I thought that this policy would help the people who elect me, I would vote for it, but I don't believe it will. I'm glad it's a referendum vote. People can decide for themselves, and perhaps with something this important it should be, and so many other questions should be voted on by all voters in general. I just caution voters to be very careful in deciding how you vote on that. A lot of times you'll get politicians who tell you that they're going to do this and that for you in an election year, and then all those promises dissipate until the next election. It's ludicrous, it's wrong, and it's wrong to try to dupe a whole group of people into believing that you have their best interests at heart when you are only looking for additional support in order to get elected. And I hope to God I never do that. I will always try to be honest with people. I was as a select woman and on the other committees that I served on. Um, I think the biggest issue that we face in this state for young people and for, for older people who experience age prejudice in this area is employment. We haven't created appreciable employment in the state of Massachusetts. We're scaring everyone away with our high taxes. In Brockton, the tax rate for a business opening up a store in Brockton 
is, as I understand, over $30 a thousand. It's ludicrous. What would bring them here? We yeah. need to work legislate, legislatively to help Brockton be able to bring people in by finding tax incentives, such as what the state of New York is doing, to attract commercial interests into the city. And I know we can do this. I know we can fix it. But we need to work hard. And the legislature, with a majority of just one party, with a majority of Democrats, there are only four Republican senators in a 40-member Senate, is comfortable. There has been no, uh, nothing to, no checks to prompt and balance. them no checks and to balance. move yeah. forward on these ideas, and no checks and balances at all to speak of. That's why I'm asking people to vote Republican this time. I would appreciate a vote for state Senate, only because it would be another Republican face on the Senate floor, and at least, hopefully, increase discussion and debate. I also believe in the use of petition, of when you find that you run up against a stone wall, you go back to your constituency, and you go back to people like you, people who are working in the studio tonight, and you say, look, will you sign this petition? that says, we demand that the legislature take a look at this issue. We, you're, we, you represent us, let's do it. Why don't we take a look? And you get a few thousand signatures, such as Jeff Deal has done um, with the gas tax, fighting that. And you use the power of petition, use people power to well, get you, what we need to get done. When last time you were in, you one thing that stuck with me was how you made the point that you're there to oversee and make sure that the people's money is being spent wisely. Whereas it just seems like the philosophy today up there is that, you know, it's not the people's money, it's our money. We'll tell you how to spend it. You know, we will tell you when and uh, why we need more money. Um, you know, in, in this case with the gas tax, you know, I, again, it's taxation without representation because it's an automatic... Um, increase without any debate, any vote, any anything. I mean, it's not doing your job as a legislator. Are you aware that four billion dollars was on the table when, or, or was it four tr uh, trillion? Now I'm going to get, I'm going <laughs> to forget my figures, folks. I'm sorry, but a lot of money was on the table. Four billion, I believe it was, not trillion. I'm thinking national and state at the same time, and I shouldn't do that. Four trillion dollars was on the billion, billion. dollars was on the table when the Massachusetts budget was being um, looked at, and legislators just decided to skirt that. There was no need to discuss that $4 billion and to move on and, and pass the budget. That's our money. That's money that this young man I was talking about a few minutes ago, who was working till probably 7 o'clock at night and doing hard labor, isn't bringing home to his family because it's going to taxes. I can't justify that. Yeah, no one, no one says that there shouldn't be taxes. Mm -hmm. We all need services. We all yes. want the government to function. We all want schools to function. We all want law enforcement. We want fire. We want services. But, you know, we don't want nonsensical waste. We want, you know, it's, if, it's, if I'm spending, if I'm using your money, I had better be I had better be very cautious and careful. When I deal with like my client's money, you know, I have, you know, their money is in the checkbook, there's an accounting, I can tell you every penny, why it's being spent, where it's being spent. I feel that that's totally lost on government. It is. It's, uh, we've, there's been one scandal after another indicating that we're throwing money and the into answer, a gutter. Right, 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 and the answer is, they, you know, people say, there isn't enough money. Oh, that, 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 is, that is, I think, the biggest fallacy. I believe the budget's ahead of itself this year in Massachusetts. There is money. It's just, and even though we, Democrats are still maintaining that they need to raise taxes and raise more money, the money is there. What taxpayers need now is to know exactly why and where it is being spent and how it is being spent and why, in response to their willingness to pay taxes, 
there are so many agencies in the state that are failing, why there are lost children, why the MBTA had to take out a bond similar to taking out a mortgage on a house in order to pay employees' salaries, and why other such instances of waste and abuse of funds is happening here in Massachusetts. We can stop this. I believe we can. It, it takes people and it takes votes, and you know this is the time that people have an opportunity to, to you know, vote in uh, a, a fresh voice, to vote in someone that uh, they might have faith in, and um, uh, you know the same old, same old isn't working, and um, you know it's it's getting tougher for people to get through the year, to get through the week, to you know get through their checkbook at the end of the month. And, um, you know, it just seems that now is the time that people have an opportunity to say, this isn't working and we need to give it another look and go in a direction that someone appreciates the fact that this is our money, not their money. I will, again, um, relate a brief anecdote. I remember as a select woman, a time when there were three of us on the board of selectmen and essentially the CEOs of a small town without a small manager, without a town manager at the time. I remember when we were reviewing plans or reviewing uh, committee proposals for a new high school. We were criticized highly because we wouldn't give a blank check to the school building committee. What we waited for were, was to see the figures that proved to us as representatives of taxpayers in Hanover, that that new high school was necessary, that it was going to cost less to build than repairing the old um, physical building that had housed high school students. Once we had that information, once it was proven to us, we signed off on the school committee proposal to build that high school. I feel the same way about state government. If you're not willing to read the budget, if you're not, and I have, if you're not willing to read the budget, if you're not willing to read the bills that come before you, you shouldn't be there. And you shouldn't be voting because, in all due respect, several other people have told you that this is the way you will vote and today. And it shouldn't be blind allegiance. No. You need to be your own was, person. Right. I was putting yeah. it <laughs> yeah. a little more nicely. but. But it's true. And so when you elect someone, whether it be me or it be someone else, I caution you to make sure that that person can stand on his or own two feet and can say no when pressured or lobbied to do something that he or she knows won't be right for the voters in that person's district or uh, town or wherever else the person is. Well. Um, we always have fun when you come in, but I guess what we're we're at probably the minute and a half mark. Oh wow! So yeah, we always time flies when you're having fun. So um, you know, what's the final message that you'd like to say to the Brockton voters who I know keep an open mind and make educated decisions, uh, especially where there's a vote that's going to be so important this November fourth. I think the final message that I have is one of need. We need to change the way we're doing business in the Commonwealth. We need to bring money back into Brockton. And the only way we're going to do that is to address the reasons that the money has left. We need to help bring businesses back here. It's a beautiful city. The people I've talked to here are very articulate. They know what they're talking about. And they care very much about how children succeed here. They want to be safe. They don't want the crime that can encroach upon large populations. I would ask you to vote for me. I would ask for your trust on November 4th to help bring back those qualities for which you moved here. And I thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Vi. Thank you, So Tom, good to have you come in. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.